Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here, coming at you from the Knife Center, and welcome to Knife AQ. This is episode 140 of the Knife Series, where I answer all your questions sharp or dull. This week, we're taking a look at one of recent history's most popular heavy-duty folding knives, as well as taking a look at frame locks, where you should get started. Let's get into it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are new to this series, we answer your questions, or at least questions that have been left in the comments section below these videos. So if you yourself have a question and you would like it to be considered for a future episode, kindly leave it in the comments below and we'll take a look. Uh, first question today comes from Judgment Kazi. Here's a question. What luck? That's the place to put them. <laughs> Excuse me. What are some knives you'd recommend for a first titanium frame lock? That's been a hole in my collection for years, and I've been more tempted to get into them recently. The more entry level the price, the better, but I know that quality knives are inherently not cheap. Sure. Um, it depends. Well, you can go, go about this in several ways. Um, and I'll start with the most expensive option I'm gonna show you and then walk it way back from there. Um, if you just want to experience it um, and see what, you know, what all the fuss is about, there's plenty of options, but if you really wanna get something that is you know, iconic in the genre and just you know, buy once, cry once sort of thing and get a truly representative example, the thing that comes to mind for me is the 562 Ti from Zero Tolerance. This is a $312 knife, so this is certainly not an entry level price, but let me explain why I think this is worthy of at least considering. First off, as mentioned, it is iconic, and it comes from an iconic designer of titanium frame locks, that being Rick Hinderer. You can see his last name here right on the back. It's similar to his XM18 folder, which that knife, uh, apart from, of course, the Chris Reeves Sabenza, which kind of started the, the entire genre, the frame lock uh, mechanism itself, in fact, I'd say the XM18 and its sort of form factor has pushed the genre forward more than any other. I mean, it's, it's such an influential, in addition to being an iconic knife. And this is as close as you can get to that in a production level price point. It also represents, I think, what is the kind of marketplace uh, dictated ideal nowadays for a titanium frame lock, which is a flipper mechanism with ball bearings in the pivot. That is by and far what most titanium frame locks uh, are made, or how most titanium frame locks come these days is with those two things. Feels very different from the Sabenza. So this is more of the feel of the other more entry level things I'm gonna show you here. But I mean, this is just a great knife. Three and a half inch blade, 20 CV steel, crisp flipping action. You've got a cool blade shape with a cool grind, the slicer grind as they call it, more robust here at the back, thinner or, or taller grind there at the tip, making it slimmer in the cross section and a little more slicey to take advantage of the belly. Just really, really sweet knife. Now walking things way, way back, uh, you can go with something like the Ontario Chicra, uh, which is a cool knife, by the way, about 40 bucks, has a titanium frame lock, has a canvas micarta front scale, however. And I wanted to kind of stay away from that. I wanted to give you something, even if, you know, I do have an inlaid option here, but I wanted to uh, show you something that, that had titanium on both sides because it's more, you know, archetypal. If it's your first one, that seems to make more sense than, uh, than something else. So the place to start is still with Ontario though, with the TI-22. This is about a $60 knife, blued titanium. There you can see both sides. Uh, Tonto blade with OS-8 steel, just over three inches and 60 bucks. It's a really cool little knife. Feels very good. It doesn't, however, quite, I, I can't quite say it feels as good as stuff three to four times the price and we'll get into some options there. Um, but if you spend just a little bit more than the $60 for this, you can get into stuff that, that really kind of strikes at the heart of the feel of what makes titanium frame lock flippers so popular these days. Uh, starting at, uh, well, for 10 bucks more, we'll get to that. $93 or thereabouts, the DEFCON 
Barracuda is a really cool knife to check out. Uh, you're not gonna get a premium steel with this. We'll get to some more other options there, but you do have a full titanium frame. This one is anodized uh, bronze. It has almost, almost more of a copper look, quite honestly, a little bit of hint of purple in there. 3.4 inch blade, D2 steel. Fantastic feel in the hand, fantastic feel in operation. The flipping is super, super crisp and satisfying. This gives you the whole titanium frame lock flipper experience, I think, for the least amount of money. It, do, it does it a little better than that TI-22, for sure. I feel like I'm, I'm dogging on the Ontario. I'm not, it just, it has, it's kind of compromises at the price point. But this does not, unless you count blade steel. That, that could be a compromise. Another thing you could check out in addition to that, which is probably like my, if I were to pick one thing, that would probably be the answer. Uh, but the SRM uh, Asika lineup is also good. The full-sized version with a four inch blade is about $115. There's a small version, actually I have it over here, two and three quarter inch for 70 bucks. And this has the feel, but it is kind of small and, and wouldn't really think of this as like the best first option. So. The large is, is kind of where I'm pointing here in this case. Big blade, 154 cm steel, titanium, kind of a classic color combination. Speaking of kind of historical precedent, the Sebenza kind of popularized the matte titanium with blue hardware. You got that trend right here too. Flipping action, quite, quite good indeed. Really nicely ground, nice thin edge. You know, the full flat grind there with the thin enough steel, this is gonna be a great, great slicing profile, even though it's not a, uh, a drop point or a trailing point, it is kind of a, eh, it might be a trailing point, Tonto, let's see. Nah, it's not quite trailing, but really cool option right here as well. If you do want uh, a particle steel to go along with it, you're gonna have to spend a little bit more money. Like I said, the DEF CON here will definitely give you the full feel of what it's all about, but I can understand you want, uh, you know, like, more premium steel. For that, you're gonna have to get almost to the $150 mark. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a few, th few things here in the 150 to 200 range as kind of the next step up uh, below the you know first two entry rungs, so to speak. But brand wide, I think Cancept offers the best bang for your buck right now, at least in your titanium frame lock flipper genre. If you don't want the premium steel, the DEF CON is my, uh, my easy recommendation. If you do, this knife is the other recommendation. This is the Sprite. Uh, comes in at about 150 bucks. You got a three and a half inch blade, S35 VN steel, little hint of recurve, but not too aggressive. Micarta inlays on the titanium on the front, which is a nice touch. Uh, you can also get carbon fiber inlays, but that's like $50 more expensive. I don't think the value uh, is quite the same as the <laughs> Micarta version here in my hands. Frame lock, contouring on both sides, not just a flat bit of metal. So that's another nice touch, a nice more premium touch that some of the, the other things here on the table actually don't have, even though they're more expensive. Nice, crisp, flipping action. Just really, really good all around. You can also check out their Cryo series. They've got a mini and a full size of that. Uh, the mini starts actually about the same price as this Sprite. Uh, the little Main Street is a little bit smaller, a little bit less expensive, like 130 bucks uh, with a Borncliffe blade. Uh, but I wanted to keep more general purpose blades here for this video. Cancept can't go wrong looking at, uh, at their stuff. Uh, Artisan Cutlery and Best Tech and even Wee Knife Company are the others I would look at in this price range. Uh, I really like the Artisan Tradition. Uh, this is the small version. There also is a large. Uh, the small here actually starts at 150 bucks too, about the same as that can set, but it's great. And for the large especially, I've kind of talked about this as a more budget alternative to the ZT we looked at up at the front. So you can kind of get the, uh, the vibes there with the artisan, if you like. And then my other kind of favorite uh, in this genre, coming in under $200, is the Wee Knife Beacon. Really clean lines, really excellent construction, fit and finish, you know, like 199.75 right now. Three and a half inch blade, 20 CV, a uh, bit of a step up from the S35s uh, that we have on these other steels, at least in, in other knives, at least in terms of edge retention. The frame is a little bit more slim, a little bit less kind of bulky tanked up uh, than some of the options here so far. 
for better or worse, whatever uh, your preferences are will determine whether that's a good or a bad thing. But the action, still super, super crisp. And I love how thin they grind their edges too. It's gonna be a very slicey knife. If you haven't done it yet, you can even do the uh, reverse flick with the fuller there, but it's gonna leave a fingerprint. So carry a cloth with you. Check those out. I hope that helps. Some definitely uh, good options there for uh, exploring a new genre of knife. Good stuff. Uh, next question comes from Mika Yanig 5512 Hey DCA and Thomas, I've got a request to ask of you. Do a comparison of the Wii Big Banter and the Spyderco Shaman. I feel like they are very similar in form factor and would like to know your thoughts. Also take a look at the Hogue K320 and Manix 2 and tell me they aren't the same knife. <laughs> well, they're not the same knife, they have different names. Obviously. I mean, clearly. <laughs> uh, it's funny you mentioned those two though, however, because you know a couple years ago, the Shaman here was incredibly hard to get a hold of. The demand uh, went through the roof and the supply wasn't there to kind of satisfy that and Spider Spiderco wasn't able to kind of ramp up and fill that need uh, for you know, a good bit. So there was kind of a clamber, a, a fervor over this knife. And at the time, I suggested both of those two knives as possible alternatives, especially now with the uh, aluminum version of the K320, you've got similar or similarities in its profile. It has a chunkier feeling handle than the, uh, in the injection molded versions, not quite as thick on the blade steel, but still a pretty heavy duty feeling knife, finger safe, more ambidextrous than the Shaman. And the Manix also likewise, a very similar possible alternative there. Again, not quite as thick on the blade steel, but you have that ambidextrous lock here that it maintains the finger safedness of the compression lock on the, uh, the Shaman. Not quite as comfortable. It's a little bit more, you know, flat slab sided than the Shaman or the, uh, the Hogue there for that matter. But yes, those are two good alternatives. Now, when we talk about the Shaman and the big banter, before I even uh, pick these up for the video, I was you know, mulling the question over in my, in my head. I thought one of these is definitely gonna feel more heavy duty than the other. And while that is still true, the difference is not as big as my, my memory made it seem. The big banter actually does feel more substantial than I remember. Kind of interesting. Ultimately, the Shaman between these two, well, here, let me hold them up here first so you can get the, uh, the look. Similar lengths, uh, sharpened edge. You've got just a hint more on the Shaman. Effective grip length. You might even have more of it uh, due to the uh, tail end of the uh, handle treatment on the banter. You might have more handle grip there. Differences. Now, the steel on the Shaman is going to be a little bit thicker and the lock is going to be a little more heavy duty than the liner lock on the big banter. Uh, that's the compression lock on the, uh, the Shaman. Rather than just being a liner lock from the spine, it actually has a tab that interfaces with the tang of the blade. So you've got force uh, acting in the lockup in multiple directions, not just one. It's also finger safe and you're not gonna get that with the big banter. Apart from that, let me see, handle comfort. The Shaman feels good. That's always been a strong point. You've got a heavy radius here on the edge of the G10. It's, it is slab sided, but the edges are all kind of curled over a bit more for a more comfortable feel. The big banter is more flat sided. Gotta say though, I honestly, everyone's hands gonna be a little bit different. There's, there's more quote unquote comfort to the Shaman, but for me, the way you have more swell at the back of the big banter is feeling really good. I almost feel a little bit more confident in my hold on the big banter. Interesting. Uh, both have that choke up point where you can get in there for finer detail behind the edge or behind the heel of the blade. You do have a sharpening choil as well on the big banter. You don't have that on the Shaman. Some folks are gonna like that a little bit better because it's less likely to snag on something you're cutting, but it will be slightly easier to sharpen on the big banter. So take that with a grain of salt too. Deep carry pocket clip on the big banter right out of the box. Four position non deep carry pocket clip on the, uh, the Shaman. Action on the big banter. Very, very good. Action on the Shaman, very, very good too. 
You do have the, uh, the flick closed thing going on. It's a little harder to flick open than some other compression lock knives because you do have that little tab from the finger guard there. And I should mention that's two things I find very important on those finger choils for a heavier use knife. You got a little extra protection. So yeah, both of them really cool. Uh, let's talk about price. I haven't talked about that yet. The Shaman these days comes in at $252 compared to $150 for this version of the Big Banter. So you'll get more heavy dutiness out of the Shaman. Is it worth $100 more to you? It's up to you to decide. Both of them pretty good. 20 CV on the, uh, the Big Banter as well. That's one thing. You'll get more edge retention, but a little less toughness than the S35 or the S30V on the Shaman. So that, that's still the big story. Like what I thought bore out, but again, it's closer than I thought in my mind's eye. More toughness out of the Shaman, more edge retention and more sliciness out of the Big Banter, but both really good, hardworking big knives in my opinion. Cool. Yeah, I think that's all, everything I got on that. Do you have anything to add? Not at all. That's perfect. Lightning round is what comes next. First question from Beware or Die. Hey DCA, I was wondering if you could address ceramic kitchen knives pros and cons. Uh, pros, they are extremely sharp right out of the box. They are hard and the edge lasts a long, long time and they are rust proof. Like you're not gonna corrode a ceramic blade. Cons, well, eventually it will need sharpening and it is gonna be a lot harder to sharpen a ceramic blade than a steel one. And it's not a tough material. It's way more prone to chipping uh, than a standard steel blade. So those would be the, uh, the drawbacks to it. And that's why I personally, you know, even though we sell ceramic knives, I try to steer people more towards the, uh, the steel options uh, because they're going to last way longer, quite honestly, especially the way most people treat kitchen knives, throwing it in a dishwasher. Don't do that. Don't do that stands even more of a chance of chipping out on you more quickly. Nobody, nobody likes that. Never is a good time. Jeremy, UN6FR. Hey, David, do pocket knives come with super steel handle scales? Why would they, would be my response to it. Um, I think that's a bit, a bit to it. Like most super steel knives, they're, you know, you're spending money on this material that can hold an edge a long time is, is mostly what, what super steel knives tend to address. You don't need your unsharpened handle to hold an edge. So I think I see, I see this with pry bars, especially sometimes you'll see like a, a magna cut pry bar. And I just look at it and I'm like, why? If you need a stainless knife that's can, that can be hard and tough that you might want a pry bar to be or any other kind of tool to be, shh, quiet. Um, there's plenty of good options out there that don't need or don't have the... It's not my fault. That don't have the stain resistance or edge holding that Magna Cut would bring, because you don't need to hold an edge. I can understand like if they're using scraps from their other blades and think, oh, I can make a pry bar out of that. Cool, that's fine. But if you're like buying sheets of you know Magna Cut to make pry bars out of them, if people are buying them, I guess I can't say you're wrong because people are buying them. But you know, it's kind of pointless. It's like my Carta blades. Edgeless. Pointless. Yeah. Well, oh, well, that does serve a purpose. We're not going to get into what that is here at the moment because now we're going to look at something that I just wanted to, to read this comment on air, so to speak. That's our comment of the day. I really enjoyed this. It made me laugh. Mr. Trentness says, I have a folding knife with S30V steel. I've noticed since I started watching videos on the quality of this steel that my knife no longer holds an edge. The blade is no longer the shape I like and my dog died. Is this steel any good? No. <laughs> This is just a fun comment. It, it tickled me. It's a good reminder to take ourselves a little less seriously sometimes. And I'm talking to you. Now we come to our final question of the day, which in an about face from what I just said is our most serious question of very the day. Serious. Very, very serious. Which comes from Christopher Williams today. Hey DCA, you mentioned the crossbones as a good pirate knife. Yes, I did some time ago. But what would be the best pirate knife if, if I was dressing up for Talk Like a Pirate Day every September 19th? Well, that's right around the corner. And you may have noticed this little thing right here. It can be clipped to you. It's the O-Knife Parrot. Every pirate needs a parrot for their shoulder. Yeah? And if you're dressing up, you need this to complete your costume. 
I do think. There you go. And the only reason it was clipped to the front is we, I tried to do this with it balanced on my shoulder and it, it got messy real quick. We're not going to do that anymore. <laughs> well, that's all we have for today. Let me know what you thought of the answers. Let me know if you have some alternate suggestions for our questioners here today. If you have a question of your own, make sure to leave it in the comments. And if you want to get your hands on one of these knives, check out the links in the description to take you to knifecenter.com. Where of course we've got our long running knife rewards program, meaning buy one of these knives today, you get to earn some free money to spend on your next one, sometimes up to 5% or more. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. That's Thomas behind the camera. We're signing off. Wait, you had a pirate joke. Yeah, I think they should get a C-J-R-B pirate. <laughs> that's pretty good. Because R is their favorite letter? Uh, you'd think so, but it's actually the C. <laughs> oh, the, the R is in cutlery could work also. It's a C stink. That's true. There's that as well. Signing off. See you guys. <laughs>